Now we're going to shift gears a little bit here and go into our rares and super rares. Those were all just commons and uncommons. The first one we have here is, I'm going to butcher this, Emma Terasu, Guide of Light. It is a three drop, white, white, colorless, 8-8. Eight, eight. When this card deals damage, you gain that much life. Uh, for two, white and rest, two recovered resonators you control. You can put this card from your graveyard onto your battlefield rested. Pay this ability only if this card is in your graveyard. It has inheritance, target creature gets plus eight, plus eight. Um, unfortunately, I know this is a super rare. I personally don't think this card is good at all, period. The inheritance deck is not going to want to run it. Um, I know people are going to force it in there just because it has the word inheritance on the card. But in the inheritance deck, you're really not wanting to take an entire turn off, not attack with two of your guys just to use your will and this just to get this back onto the field. And when it's on the field as an 8-8 for 3, I know you're gaining life, but it's just it's just not that great. I don't see it being good in really anything unless you're trying to run some sort of a life gain deck and you want him in there as something that's just going to maybe block or maybe attack once or twice or block once or twice and, and gain you 800 a couple times. Here we have our next is Bastet, the Goddess of Cats. It is a 300-700 Cthulhu creature for two. It is one white, or I'm sorry, one red, one colorless. If a Cthulhu you control would deal damage to a J Resonator, it deals double that much damage instead. It has inheritance to put five limit counters on target Cthulhu. So here's why this card is tricky. As of right now, Cthulhu are not a tier one deck. They could probably be forced into trying to be, but it would probably be a burn slash Cthulhu style deck. But I will say this. If you are ever going to make a deck with Cthulhu in it, this card absolutely has to be in there as a four of. Um, this card is just insane. It's nuts in that style of deck. The deck is very, very limited, though, on what you would play this in. It's, it's not going to go in anything other than a tribal Cthulhu deck. But in that deck, it's going to be incredible. Here we have one of my personal favorites in the set, Curse of the Kiwabi. This is a quick cast, one black, one green, and X. Cancel target non-resonator spell unless its controller pays X. If it was canceled this way, search its controller's deck, graveyard, and hand for all copies with that same name and remove them from the game. Then they shuffle their deck. This card is nuts against control decks. This card is nuts against space-time anomalies and water transformations and seals of wind and light and any kind of counter spells. Like any sort of deck that is going to try to control your style of play in any way, shape, and form, you should bring this card in against if you can cast it. Um, it is phenomenal it's mind-blowingly good um you may want to keep it in the side uh you may want to put it in the main against creature specific only decks this is a dead card um you know you could probably hit a regalia with it which is you know i never thought about that but that's pretty good too but you know it's gonna have to be late game you're not gonna be able to cast this off till at least three they're gonna drop the regalia on one most of the time but you know this card is phenomenal if you are in these colors if you're in control you must have some number of these in your main and or sideboard. Here we have our big 12 Apostle Dragon, the Dimension Dragon Nidhogg. He is a five drop, three black, or six drop, sorry, three black, three colorless, 12-12 flyer. When it enters the battlefield, remove all resonators your opponents control with the lowest total cost among resonators your opponents control from the game. This guy sucks. He is terrible. Number one, though, the will restrictions on casting him, having to have three black and then three colorless, and the fact that even at six, he's only a 12-12 flyer, which, you know, for that cost, you should be higher. And most of the time, like, yeah, if you're playing against Turbo Gwyber, you're going to get to eat all their tokens. But most of the time, this guy is going to kill one, maybe two. If you're super-duper lucky, three cards. And then that's it um, for the cost, for the will restriction on it, for how hard he is to cast. He should do a lot more than that. I, I would say this guy probably shouldn't see a ton of play unless you're trying to build some sort of cute 12 Apostle deck with Gil Lapis or something like that. Here we have the backbone of the inheritance deck, in my opinion, the Divine Beasts of Adoradia. 
Adarctica. Sorry, I'm being corrected over here. Uh, it is green and white, two drop, six, six. Whenever you play an inheritance ability, it does not have to target this card, just any time at all. This card gets plus 200, plus 200, and whenever this card deals damage, you gain that much life until end of turn. Now, you'll notice that there's a quote around whenever this card deals damage, you gain that much life. You have to assume, like imagine that that text is literally going on this card. So imagine it printed there. So if you do another inheritance ability, that text is going to go on there again. If you do a third inheritance ability, it's going to go on there again. So say you have this guy in play and you use two different inheritance abilities. He's going to become a 1,000-1,000 that when he deals damage, you gain that much twice. So you're going to gain 2,000 life. This guy is very, very good. And he himself has inheritance. If you ever just want to get through the last 600 points, he's right there. So this guy is, is an absolute you know, backbreaker in that deck and should be used. Here we have Faded Reunion. It is one colorless, one black. Chant, choose one, or if you control two or more darkness resonators, you may choose both. Search your library for a card, and then shuffle the rest of your deck and put it on the top, or draw a card. Um, I like this card. It's it's not bad as a one of in control decks, you know, along the same lines as some of the other cards we've spoken about, where they're going to allow you to go through and find your answer that you may need. Um, it's not as good as <clears throat> if it was quick cast, simply due to the fact that if they have something in play, you know, you're going to have to have at least an entire turn of setup for this card. You're going to have to cast it on your turn and not draw it until the next turn unless you happen to be having like Risen and Elder play. Or if you're playing in the blue black token style deck, um, you could absolutely have you do both, in which case this card is phenomenal. Um, but yeah, in, in any sort of deck that's going to have a wide variety of answers in the deck, I could absolutely see playing this card so that you can, you know, dig for your uh, situation specific answers. Here we've got Feasting. Feasting the Fate Spinning Winds. She is a 600 600 for two, one green, one colorless. She has Quick Cast. <clears throat> when this card enters your field, you may return another target resonator you control to its hand. So you can protect something kind of but you got to recast it again it has inheritance um it's inheritance says target j resonator gets plus six plus six until on the turn then you can search your library for that card we spoke about early feastings monocle and put it into your field if you do shuffle your deck now feastings monocle is not something that's going to see play in the inheritance deck because your creatures in the inheritance deck are either going to be the ones that are attacking or the ones that you are discarding to make your attacking creatures better so if you want to play this card as a card that is either a two drop six six or a card that has an inheritance for two that gives plus six plus six that's totally suitable and acceptable but please remember just because a card says that you can do something doesn't mean you have to so if you're going to play this please do not play feastings monocle with it in that deck other decks maybe sure but not in the inheritance deck it's just going to slow you down it's just going to water your deck down Next, we have Final Breeze. Final Breeze is a quick cast, one green, one colorless. Return target spell to its owner's hand, and if you're torrented, your opponent cannot play spells this turn. I really, really, really like this card. Um, this card is uh, the equivalency of the card Remand plus Orm's Chant in Magic. It's two of the stronger cards, all kind of smashed into one good card here. It is going to allow you to go carte blanche on an entire turn once you cast this off and just do kind of whatever you want to do, knowing that you're going to be free from counter spells, you're going to be free from spot removal or any sort of sneaky shenanigans. This card is, is absolutely great and should see some number of play in most of the decks that are going to be in that color. Um, you know, it, it bare, bare, bare minimum sideboard, but I'd recommend throwing a couple in the main. The card is just really super great. And now we have an answer to Captain Hook here. We have Grusa Balesta, the Magic Stone Researcher. He has black and green and colorless. He is a sixth stage that says Magic Stones you control gain barrier. This card gains plus 100, plus 100 for each Magic Stone you control with a different name. And when it is put into your field, banish any number of Magic Stones and then put the top X cards of your Magic Stone deck into your field where X is the number of stones you banished. This guy also gets swiftness and precision as long as you have five or more magic stones with different names. I don't think that bottom ability is going to be hyperly relevant too often because you're, you're going to be pretty greedy stone-based, I'm going to say, if you're going to get that off. 
However, the fact that Hook can't touch your stones, the fact that this guy most of the time is going to drop on three as at least an 8-8 or a 9-9, the fact that, you know, if you don't like the stones you have in play, you can sack them off and get new ones. Like, this guy is just super great. Like, definitely, definitely, definitely sideboard. Um, I would consider playing some in the main of him if you're in those colors just because, like I said, he fixes your stones for you, you know, and – Everybody who's ever played a card game ever knows how sucky it is when you're sitting in the wrong color will or the wrong color mana and you have the opposite color of cards in hand. And it happens a lot. And this guy's really good against protecting that. Plus, like I said, he's, he's going to be a decent-sized beater in most situations. So he's, he's a very good guy. Here we have Joan of the Ark, the Pious Flame. She is two white and two red for a 1,000-1,000 with swiftness, precision, and first strike. So stats are great. Like, I love the stats. Hate the casting cost. It's too specific. It's too, you know, absolutely finite. You have to have two white. You have to have two red. I know there's ways to cheat her into play in this set, but overall, I am not a massive fan of this card. It's it's not going to see a ton of play, or it shouldn't see a ton of play. I think it's strictly less good than Athena was. And Athena didn't see a ton of play. Um, so, yeah, not, not a big fan of this one. Here we have another one of my favorites from the set, Lumia's Judgment. One red, one white, and X. Remove all non-Magic Stone, non-J Ruler cards with total cost of X or less from the game. This card is sweet. Um, I mean, just casting it off as red and white and removing all of your opponent's regalia from the game seems great those those pesky death sites that are bugging bugging you are just gone forever no getting them back you know for for zero it removes all of feasting's tokens you know for one and two it just absolutely cripples most night decks and and other sort of mana ramp decks and worst case scenario in, in a deck that's going to play you know control where you can splash this card and just late game, you can you can draw this thing really late and just sit on it. And if they drop Gwyber, go off on the board for six. You know, like the card has a, it's very versatile, has a lot of uses, and and I expect to have this card see a lot of play. It's I don't think the decks they're going to play are going to play play sets, but a one, two, and or three of depending on your current meta game is definitely not out of the question. Here we have Lumia's Purification. It is a chant with remnant. It is three casting costs, white, white, colorless, destroyed target, rested, non-magic stone card. This one is kind of tricky. So it's really, really cool that it blows up J rulers. It is really, really cool that it blows up regalias and, and everything, creatures. Um, this card would be absolutely backbreaking if it had quick cast. If it had quick cast, this would be probably my favorite card in this entire set. I still think that it is very playable, though. Um, in things like you know zero control I, I could easily see this being a two or three of it has remnant so you get to cast it off again um the the value is definitely there so I, I would say this is a card that i could see a lot of people overlooking and not giving enough credit to but i would say definitely you know look again i think this card could be very good in a, in a majority of decks that would run these colors and want to be more of the control style of play you're not going to want to put this in aggro you're not going to want to throw this into knights you're going to want to you know streamline stuff but in, in a control shell absolutely run a couple of these guys and the newest version of kaguya kaguya the lunar researcher she is green white and colorless for a 700 800 you may, or she has flying, you may pay one less to play this card if you control a moon, so she can be a two drop. And whenever this card, or whenever a card is bestowed to this card, recover this card. Um, she's not great. Like, down the road, give her a bunch more bestow cards, make some more really broken ones, maybe, you know. But as of right now, there's not enough tools out there to be able to make her work. You know, this is the type of card that once there's enough tools, she becomes the center point of a deck. But until she's the center point of a deck, there she's just not good enough to be in any deck. I would say, um, you may disagree, but you know that's just just my personal opinion on the matter. And now the best Kaguya card in the set, Kaguya's Moonbeam Butterfly. It is one green, one white, and X. Search your deck for a Resonator or Addition with cost of uh, X plus one or less, and put it in the field. I like this card. I like it a lot. Um, it's probably not going to be amazing in a lot of your tier one decks, but um, 
you know, any any strong creature-based decks or any decks that have a lot of creatures that have enter the battlefield triggers, you know, in, in the red-white deck where it's all the enter battlefield, if you can splash green to get this guy in there, you can really search your deck for, for any creature you have that, you know, has a response to the current situation that you're in and just drop it straight into play and let its ability trigger. So this card is, is definitely a good card. Um, and I'd be interested to see where this is going to find a home. But definitely in the enter the battlefield deck, I would say this card should... If you can splash it, you should splash it. And now for our black white tokens deck, we have Mooj Dart. Mooj Dart, the Lady of Illusions, is black, blue, and two colorless for an 8 8. She's a flyer. Other water resonators you control get plus two, plus two. Other darkness resonators you control get plus two, plus two. And you can banish a fantasy resonator, which remember all those tokens we're producing are fantasy resonators. And this card gains barrier chant in Thunder Turn so she can protect herself. Um, also, the creatures that are producing those fantasy resonator tokens are also fantasy resonators, keep in mind. Um, so if you have a card like those blue-black tokens, remember that her abilities are separate lines of text. So they are water resonators, so they will get plus two, plus two, plus two. Plus two. And they also are darkness resonators, so they will get plus two, plus two from that. So if you have a water and darkness resonator, it will get plus four, plus four. So in that style of deck... Her, it, she is great. You know, you can drop two of them in play. The two of them will pump each other, and they'll double pump all the tokens, or I suppose in this case quadruple if they're dual colored. So in that style of deck, she's just going to be awesome. And now we have the best non-castable card in the set, I think. So we have Narlathep, the Crimson Radiant. Um, it's actually a really good card. It's it's. Black, or it's uh, red and it's white and it's a 7-7 seven, seven. has limit 1 and it has awakening white when this card enters your field remove target resonator from the game when it leaves the field put that creature back um, one thing to note those are separate lines of text they can be abused like if you have a card that allows you to bounce a creature to your hand you can drop her in response to her first trigger when you awaken her that says remove target resonator from the game in response to that trigger going on to the chase you can bounce this card it'll go back to your hand which will trigger its second ability which says when it leaves so the second ability says when it leaves put it back into play or will go off first which won't do anything because nothing's been removed yet and then the first ability will go off which will permanently remove that resonator from the game so goofy shenanigans it's possible you can do it um it also has Awakening of Red. When this card enters your field, you may play a light or fire chant with cost three or less from your hand without paying its cost. So it's really cool. It, it's, it's mana neutral at that point in time. You know, you're, you're paying three to cast it and awaken it, and you're getting three for free. And then obviously at the end of turn, if there are no limit counters on it, remove it. Um, like, it's totally playable. You can totally use it in, in the Blink deck, the Enter the Battlefield deck. It's, it's very good in there. Um, but I think... What this is going to be used most for, you're, you're going to be most excited to draw this card so that you can pitch it to Lumia, so that Lumia can be great, because she's so much better as dinner for Lumia than as a creature in play, don't get me wrong, you draw multiple of them, you only, and you only need to flip, uh, you only need to discard this card to Lumia once, so the other ones you cast, yeah, sure, go ahead and exile stuff, uh, or remove them from the game, and, and cast some, you know, fire chants and things like that, um, but yeah, this, this card will be expensive, though, because Lumia is absolutely great and she's an absolute four of in, in any lumia deck because you have to have her when you're flipping lumia here we have the cutest little card in the set magic stone life form is one green 300 300 when this card is put into your graveyard from your field produce one will of any color there's really only one deck this will ever see play in it is in the turbo guiber variant that runs adam broly's in that deck it's super good it's gonna you know add two mana or two will so it's it's very good in that sense but in everything else it's not going to be great the best case scenario if you have lave in play it's a card that you can cast for one green and, and filter and get the perfect color for that one turn one time but you're losing a card so it's it's yeah only in that deck but in that deck great Here we have Nightmare of Ashen Dream. This is a three drop, black and blue, and colorless for a 2 2. When it enters the field, return target resonator to its owner's hand, and then its controller discards a card. Um, in the blue black deck, I absolutely love this guy. You're going to have things like Water Magic and Space Time Anomaly that are going to be keeping the board clear. Um, 
you know, run a discard package till they're down to the till they're down to no cards in hand. Then whatever you're bouncing back, they're just discarding right away. Um, I'd probably not run more than one or two of these in that deck. Uh, Mooj Dart makes it a little more appealing simply to the fact that it becomes a six six, but still a six six at three cost isn't super good. Its ability is relevant. Its ability is good. Uh, but its ability becomes a lot less good if they have multiple cards in hand and they get to pick what they're getting rid of. So I would say this card, sure, go ahead and play it if you're running a discard package. If you're not running a discard package, I would avoid this guy. Now we have Rachel Alhamat's advisor. She is a two drop, blue, blue, 600, 600. She has inheritance of two blue, return target resonator to its owner's hand. I actually really like her a lot. She It's an instant speed, bounce a creature, and um, just a very good card. You know, the, it can go out, because it can go off at instant speed, if, if uh, Inheritance becomes a legitimate threat in the new metagame, she's just going to be great because they're going to stack everything they have up. They're going to go to kill you in one turn, and you're going to be able to go ahead and use her Inheritance to bounce it back to its hand. Um, doesn't have to be tapped, and because it's not actually casting a spell, this is an ability, they're not going to be able to counter it. So Inheritance decks, because of the fact that they're inherently green-white, um, they are going to play a counter spell package. So just be ready for that and know that this is a very good sideboard card for that. Along the same lines as Narlathep, we come to Runic Commander Demon Akiat. This is a two-drop. It is blue, and it is red, and it is a 6-6. It is 7 Lumiere's Demon. When this card enters your field, put a mana counter on your ruler, and whenever you play a chant, you may return this card to its owner's hand. Um, it's okay. It's not great. It would never actually see play, except for the fact that you're going to run four of them in every soul deck you make, because when you flip soul, he's going to be sacrificed at the altar to put five more mana counters on soul. And strictly because of that, and only because of that, he will see value. He'll probably be two, two and a half, three bucks just because of that, because the decks that are going to run him are going to run that. Um, I would say keep a strong eye out for full art and foil versions of that as they have the potential to go way higher. Um, but yeah, other, you know, even late game though, if you got to, if you want to cast them down, drop a, drop a mana counter on your ruler. Then when you go to cast a chant, you back, bounce them back to your hand, flip your ruler and discard them. Then, Hey, you're, you're, you're plus one mana counter, you know, Maybe you even got in a hit for 600. Who knows? Now there's Reunion of Sisters. This is a three-drop blue spell. Choose one, uh, or if you control a light and water resonator, you may choose both. Draw two cards or return target resonator to its owner's hand. This card does not have quick cast, so this card is garbage. It is not good. I would say this is one of the bulkier bulk rare cards in this set. It's... You know, yeah, drawing two cards is great. You're only netting one, though. You know, it's just not going to be good. I would not recommend playing this card ever. The color in, in blue, there's always better options on this card. And here we have Steam Explosion. This is an Ancient Magic spell. It is blue, red, and X. This card deals X damage, or uh, 200 damage multiplied by X to target, resonator, and to your opponent. So this card is very good, but be careful. It's also a trap. If you're playing against anything that can interact with creatures, can kill creatures, can bounce creatures, can flicker creatures, can, can remove them from the game, anything, they can neutralize the spell. Because it's all one line of text, it's not separated by periods uh, like space-time anomalies where you can still draw. If they're able to make the creature uh, an illegal target or a non-existent target, this card will not go off. All it will be is a card that you sunk a bunch of either will into or a bunch of your mana counters into, and it's not going to work. So use it, but use it sparingly. Use it wisely. Use it wisely. You know, don't run it head on into counter spell decks if you're using your mana counters. Just play smart with it. Is all I'm saying. Now we have Snow White of the Crystal Apple. She is a four drop zero zero. Enters the battlefield with two one one counters on her for each light magic stone you control. Remove a 1-1 counter from her for one white to put a 1-1 counter on target light resonator. So she's actually a really decent card. Like in, in a mono white deck, she's just got a base stat of an 8-8, eight eight, you know, and drop her later, she's going to be bigger. She is completely immune to or water, or the water transformation because she has a base stat of 0-0. Zero, zero. If they shoot water transformation, all it's going to do is make her 4 bigger. So 
If your metagame is super duper duper heavy on water transformations, this one and you know the seven dwarves that go with it are a very good option. Here we have Time Guide Admiral Alfred. Has a three drop, eight, eight in red. When this card enters your field, if you remove two or more mana counters from your ruler this turn and you've produced no will, put two mana counters on your ruler. So, eh, meh. Like, basically what they're trying to get you to do is remove three mana counters from your ruler, play this, and get two of them back. So it's a one drop, eight, eight, which theoretically seems fine. But in the decks that you're going to have a bunch of mana counters on your rulers, you're going to want to use those for big, huge, nasty spells. You're not going to want to waste them on this guy. So... I wouldn't recommend this one in any decks. Now there's Twin Headed Dragon is a blue, red, and two colorless flying. You may spend will to pay this card's awakening cost as though it were uh, as though this were ancient magic. So this card has awakening of red. When this card enters your field, it deals 1,000 damage target resonator or awakening of blue. When it enters your field, rest up to two target resonators. They don't recover during their controller's recovery phase. I really like this guy. He is a giant beating beat stick with great enter the battlefield triggers. Um, you can use mana from your ruler to cast this. Um, it's just really good. I would recommend probably a one, maybe a two of in the soul decks, um, if not more, depending on what your current meta is. Yeah, the awakening cost, yep, uh, correct, David, yep. The awakening cost is, is what you can use the mana counters for, but I mean, as a four drop, you know, 1,000, 1,000 flyer with those abilities, you're going to get to kill a guy and tap down up to two more. Seems really good to me. And here we come to our last Chimera, the Manticore. He's a 9-9 nine, nine flyer for five, black, green, and three colorless. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, uh... Choose one, look at your opponent's hand, and choose a card. They discard it or destroy target additional regalia. Not a big fan. Like, this is this is less, for me, it's for me anyways, this is less exciting than the other two Chimeras, and the other two Chimeras aren't even rares. Um, don't get me wrong, not saying it won't see play. Nine Tails will play it because it's a Chimera, and Chimera are so limited, and he can only search for Chimera. Um so it'll definitely see play in there, and it's cool because Nine Tails lets you search for whatever Chimera you want. Each one of them has their own unique, distinct abilities, so they're all good for different scenarios, and you can kind of pick which one you want at which time. So it'll be played, but only in that Nine Tails deck. Here we have a card that is going to be a one of main, or at least a two of side, in almost every control deck on the planet. Um... This is Valentina's Reach. It's black, it's blue, it's X. It is a chance. Choose one. Your opponent discards X cards or you draw X cards. Everybody who plays control decks knows exactly how annoying it can be when you are going super late game and you are in the draw go phase and everybody's got a full grip of cards and nobody has anything in play. Think about top decking this card, you know, especially if, if you're playing against like more of a creature removal heavy deck and not so much a counter spell deck. Being able to top this and just say, you discard your entire hand and now I'm going to go off. Or drawing it late game after you do go off but don't win successfully and just saying, now I'm going to cast this and draw eight. You know, it just, it's very, very good. Both of its individual modes and options are backbreaking in almost every card game they're printed in. And the fact that they put both of them on one card to choose from is nuts. This card is insanely good. Um, and this is another one of these cards where I, I would, if you have the chance to get the full arts, get them, sit on them, wait on them. The longer this game goes and the more steam it picks up, the more valuable these cards will be. This card is great. Now we have World Flame Summoning. Choose two. Your opponent banishes a Magic Stone or this card deals 800 damage to each resonator your opponent controls or this card deals 800 damage to your opponent or this card deals 1,500 damage to target J-Ruler. So this is an ancient magic spell that is just great. There's just answers for everything you could ever want answers for on here. So this card is going to be in Soul. This card is going to be in Mars. It's going to be played. It's going to be awesome. You're never going to be sad to have it. Um, it's just going to answer pretty much whatever you need answered out there and then deal damage to face if you needed to. 
So this card is, you know, super good. I would say I probably wouldn't run a solid four of in those decks, but a two to three, two to three is probably right in the range where you want to be. Here we have Yashahim, Yashahimi, the first daughter of Makage. She's a three drop, seven, eight. When this card enters your field, move all one one counters from all other J resonators to this card. For one black, remove a one one counter from this card uh, to put two one one counters on another target vampire you control. This card here is going to be the card that's going to be really super abused in that deck that's throwing all the counters on it. This card's going to be a backbone in that deck. And you're going to want to play a four of her in there. Um, she's super dumb because the one spell that lets you have them sacrifice a guy and then put counters on all their guys. Then you drop her the next turn and she just becomes a giant because of the fact that they had to kill one of their guys. So in that deck, super duper awesome, super duper great. All right.